Oh, yeah. Drive away everybody on my channel. Boy, that's a brilliant way to keep the thing going. <laughs> Hi there. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to my can and welcome to uh, my channel, Cast Iron Chaos, here on St. Patrick's Day, uh, March 17th. Um, and I know the subject seems a little bit unusual, but well, that's largely because, uh, I fully admit this is kind of like, uh, me, uh, talking about a subject that I just wanted to be talking about. And really I'm anybody at all kind enough to show up. Well, thank you very much. And I can only hope that I don't hope I don't bore you too much. Hello. Hello, Papa Dan. And, uh, hello, Big John or the Big John. Anyway, it's uh, nice to see you here. So yeah, it's going to be probably less hectic than it was last night. But on the other hand, I still hope the cooking turns out well. What we're looking at incidentally is kind of tied into, uh, what I look, what, uh, the subject of, uh, tonight's little talk, I guess you could say, <laughs> because yeah, um, that's why I call this like a cast iron muck bang or mukbang but i think it's pronounced more like mukbang uh in that i'm going to be uh, doing some cooking largely because mukbang is uh you know kind of popular on youtube as like an eating show where somebody eats and eats and eats a lot of food and probably talks about some subject or another while they're eating but i think on this channel i'm sure folks would rather see somebody cooking and that's uh what i hope to do so it's pretty much i'm going to be cooking as i uh, talk about the uh, subject and in a way it started out as well with uh cat with uh, cast iron and kind of uh, went off on a uh, into a world of its own which is why <laughs> it's not entirely unrelated but as I said, what we're looking at right now, in fact, is a uh, stove, and it's pronounced stove, not stob, a uh, very large enameled uh, cast iron Dutch oven. Here's my hand here, just to see, uh, give you an idea of the uh, size of this thing. It's like about uh, 13 quarts in size or so, so it's pretty darn big. It's the same size as my old Le Creuset enameled uh, cast iron pot, in fact. And the reason why I brought this out, well, as I will get into a little bit more detail, uh, this was actually paid for, at least in part, with Bitcoin. So, yeah, there actually is kind of a tie-in, more or less, to the uh, cast and, and to the cooking. But, as I said, what I hope to do as well is to, well, I guess, start out by telling a little story, too. So, which, again, I hope doesn't bore anybody too much. On the other hand, uh, as I said before, it is uh, thanks not Thanksgiving. <laughs> it is St. Patrick's Day, and well, um, as you know, a lot of people have done their uh, corned beef and cabbage today. I did mine early, in fact. I started slow cooking it last night, and if you've seen the uh, videos I've posted, uh, it was ready early this morning. So we are already in the leftover phase, and that's why we move on to the next part of uh, St. Patrick's Day, and that is, of course, corned beef hash a.k.a. leftover hash, also a.k.a. bubble and squeak. And that's something I've been looking forward to uh, making. As... Yeah, exactly. As uh, Jamie says, a.k.a. how in the hell is there corned beef leftover? So, <laughs> but yeah, we actually do have a little bit of leftovers yet. So um, <clears throat> let's uh, pull over. Let's get a uh, another view of the uh, stove here. And let's pull out the Lodge Cast Iron Walk, and let's uh, get started, shall we? As I will uh, be going into the uh, details of this in a little bit. Okay, that means... There we go. Ugh, so this microphone's at a good place now, so that it will... Um, you know, that way, I sh you should be able to hear me talking more than the fan. And this, uh, the oven has been heating up the uh, cast iron wok because especially with a crappy electric stove like mine and a thick cast iron wok, about the best way to get this thing hot enough. Oh, darn it. I should have uh, turned, I should have turned that temperature up before. Oh, didn't think of that. Oh, well. About the best way to uh, get a uh, cast iron wok uh, a heavy cast iron wok ready to for cooking, especially at high heat, is to heat it up in the oven, which is how we're going to start here. And with that, let's go. I, yeah, gotta be careful. This thing is really heavy and really hot. Yeah. Oh boy, there we go. And this is a big 14 inch wok, too. Let's bring this up. 
And there we are. Now, fun. Now we start the fun part. And incidentally, here is the corned beef, uh, the leftover corned beef and cabbage that we're going to be looking cooking. Boy, doesn't this look appetizing. Well, that's another beautiful thing, well, I guess you could say beautiful, about uh, corned beef hash in that um, rather than have these have this uh, cold, mushy stuff sit in the refrigerator until, uh, they, until it finally rots and has to be thrown out, this way we get to take it out and actually make something tasty with it. There we go. And with that... Well, all we have to do really is start heating it up. It's already cooked, so let's get to the fun part. <laughs> Definitely hot enough, that's for sure. Oh yeah, this is gonna sear nicely too. I like that. That's another nice thing about a uh, heavy cast iron wok is that you can do something like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Essentially, I just want to break all of this stuff up. And once everything is hot, I will refry it. In fact, I think I can even put in another scoop right now. So, want a little bit more of this. And a little bit more of that. Do this right. <sighs> There we go. Yeah, they call this, in, in, in jolly old England, they call this leftover hash, and they give it a wonderful name called Bubble and Squeak. Uh, I'm told the name originally became popular around World War II in the time of the London Blitz, when, as you know, uh, you know ev people had to uh, pretty much hoard everything they could and use up every bit of resources that they, that they could. Um, you know, because, of course, they were constantly being bombed and bombarded during the uh, Battle of Britain. So they would frequently, and so they started uh, really cooking and recooking their uh, leftovers, coming up with a uh, phrase that, again, they called it bubble and squeak. There are a couple of, oh, here's a bone, in fact. <laughs> Let's move that away. There are a couple of... Uh, urban legends as to why it uh, was called that. Some people say, and my personal opinion, is that the name uh, actually makes it more attractive sounding to the kids. You know, it's a, you know, it sounds like something that a kid would want to eat. On the other hand, some, some other folks say bubble and squeak is the sound that, it, that the food makes as it's cooking. And some other people say bubble and squeak is a sound that you make. At be during and after you after you eat it. <laughs> Nonetheless, all we're doing right now is just heating this up, and then after that, we will go in and really try to sear this and get the uh, dried bits going. And having said that, uh, yeah, oh yes, so I always wondered what that term meant. Well, hello as well, craft for others and roadside assistance guy. Call some of our lunches in grade school bubble and squeak. Yeah, 45 or 50 years. Wow. <laughs> didn't think the term was that. Well, no, I knew the term was that old, but I didn't think it would be that long since you heard it. <laughs> anyway, it's really just no more than reheating up these leftovers. However, having said that, as promised, yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, this particular subject because it's something just about everybody here has seen in the news recently, and I'm sure you've probably been approached one way or another online, even indirectly, because, you know, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, are really a subject that seems to be on everybody's lips these days. In fact, uh, I read in a uh, news, news article only the other day that uh, our dear friend uh, Mark Zuckerberg is going to be introducing NFTs to inter Instagram and Facebook, which means they're probably going to barge their way in just about every uh, corner of those uh, platforms that you, that you can think of. And it might even include my web page, no, my Facebook group, although I hope not. Here's another thing I don't want. To yeah, that is hot or maybe even the cast iron cooking group. Furthermore, you can uh, 
Twitter has introduced NFTs to its uh, platform already. If you uh, do a subscription, yeah, you know, Twitter actually has a subscription service they call Twitter Blue, something like three ninety nine a month or something, a way to make them revenue. And among other things, if you uh, subscribe to their uh, platform, um, they will reward you by allowing you to set up your profile picture as an NFT, which is really stupid if you ask me. Um, okay. Which I guess gets into the question, what exactly are these NFTs anyway, non-fungible tokens? Um, they are related to cryptocurrency, yes, um, but not really so much intricately built in. Uh, it's more like this, the whole stupid crypto culture has become enamored with them, uh, largely because it represents, well, it is, in fact, yes, I will say NFTs are something of a ripoff. Uh, I'm not going to, um, I mean, I do have a link on my uh, page on this uh, description of this video to a uh, really useful documentary, which some of you may have already seen. It's over two hours long, though, but it really, really gets down into the whole crypto culture thing, uh, including Bitcoins and NFTs and uh, gaming uh, and crypto with gaming and so on. And that, of course, is the documentary Line Goes Up, the problem with NFTs. Now, I'm not just going to say, oh, watch this. Yes, this is right. And NFTs are a ripoff. Um, I was very impressed by it. Yes, uh, I do feel there are a couple of parts that I don't think he put enough uh, emphasis on. And in addition, I have as well seen some of the uh, blowback or the uh, responses that video has received. Um, boy, I think this thing is already at the point where I can probably put this aside and uh, do another batch. I'm not done with this, actually. In fact, I'm going to start refrying it in uh, just a few minutes. Let's get this in. However, as promised, I want to tell you a bit of a story as well. You see, um, about five or six years ago, um, I was actually approached by a uh, very popular member of the cast iron cooking community. This person, I am not going to name names. Number one, I'm not interested in gossip. Number two, he actually lost money at this, and so I'm, don't, I'm sure he would appreciate it if I did not mention his name for that reason. So, But my condolences, he's a friend of mine. Um, nonetheless, um, this was around 2016, 2017, when the first uh, big, when crypto, and especially Bitcoin, really went mainstream. This is when the uh, first... Uh, in explosive rise in uh, crypto prices and the value of Bitcoin and all that began to shoot up. And it went mainstream and caught a lot of people's eyes and started something of a gold rush. I mean, yes, crypt, uh, Bitcoin had been around since like about 2011, 2012. Uh, it remained mostly underground and in the realm of the, uh, you know, the, those areas of the internet up until about that time when, as I said, it suddenly just like that, hit everybody's, uh, got everybody's attention and really started becoming popular. And it was around then that <clears throat> it was advised that, you know, I should really look into this because, you know, the way the prices were going, it's like, you know, you, you could really make a killing if you got into this. And here's the thing is that he wanted to, he had started investing in one particular, um, uh, cryptocurrency uh, company uh, that has since become infamous. Their name was BitConnect. And uh, as it turned out, as if anybody knows that name, you know very well, BitConnect turned out to be nothing more than a big pump and dump scam uh, in that it quite literally crashed overnight and a whole lot of people lost their shirts on it. He didn't lose his shirt on it. He did lose some money, though, a fair amount of money, if I understand right. He also told me that his brother, shortly before the crash, had invested about $50,000 in BitConnect. And yeah, as far as I know, that was all lost. So he definitely has my condolences, which is why, as I said, I am not mentioning my name and any names. 
As for me, I was offered the opportunity to uh, get in on this, and I was cautious, maybe too cautious. I started looking around and, well, as they say, doing some research into this whole Bitcoin and, and crypto thing before I was going to uh, invest in it. And I saw a few things that did indeed raise some red flags. It seems that uh, there were, in fact, questions going around about how solvent BitConnect was in that it was tending to uh, deflect any uh, inquiries into, uh, you know, the, actually the source of its financing or how much uh, they had really in the way of reserves, uh, as well as their business practices. I mean, they had apparently come out of nowhere, had been started up by a few people from India. And then just like overnight, they suddenly went from nothing to uh, supposedly a, at least a couple of billion dollars in value. So, yeah, this unfortunately, on, on my case, it kind of raised some red flags and I was reluctant to uh, take a chance on something like that. My searching around, I felt that it seemed a lot safer to go with what at that time was the number one crypto uh, currency uh, going around at that time, and that was Bitcoin. At that time, Bitcoin had, uh, as I said, had exploded in its uh, value. Uh, that was the year when uh, Bitcoin really went mainstream in that it had already risen to about uh, one Bitcoin was about at the beginning of the year, it had a value of about $1,000 for one Bitcoin. By, the, by December of that year, um, I was already too late for this, uh, it had exploded to about $20,000 for one Bitcoin. So yeah, that means you know, it hits, its value had increased uh, about 2,000% all within one year. So yes, you better believe this started a gold rush. And uh, it had it had already passed its peak, and it was somewhere around maybe thirteen thousand dollars when I decided I would take the plunge and invest in it. And as I said, I was cautious. Uh, I started out by investing about well, I actually did take out about six hundred dollars and uh, started a Bitcoin wallet at, at uh, one of the uh, Bitcoin. Uh, uh, trading companies and that got me after the fees and everything like that i had a whopping oh about 13 cents in bitcoin so you know like 0. 0.0 no yeah 0.13 uh bitcoin which really didn't mean a lot so i wasn't sure what to do then because it, that was the point when where bitcoin's price in fact was just starting to fall so I realized what you're supposed to do is uh, start uh, trading and start, um, you know, taking risks and uh, becoming a trader and, 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 and all of those fun things. You know, the things they do when they play the stock market. I was too timid to do that. So I sat and waited and watched as the price of Bitcoin at that time started going down and down. And then there was a real crash in that within the space of just a few days, it dropped from 13,000 to about 8,000 and then about 5,000. And this, of course, was when uh, they say the bubble burst and a whole lot of people started panicking and getting out of there. Uh, I sat and waited. When the price of Bitcoin dropped to about $3,000, I thought, you know, now might actually be a good time to actually uh, get some more of it. And so I sank another few hundred in. And this was when I managed to get my reserves, my Bitcoin reserves up. Um, yeah, because the price had really gone down by that point. I, that same amount of money got me a little bit more. And that's when I ended up with uh, just a tad more than one third or 0.33 Bitcoin. This was about five years ago. So that seemed nice. And at this point, like I said, well, I guess all I could do now was wait. And because this was a bubble that had just crashed, um, I really didn't see any other choice but to just, you know, just simply wait and ride it out and see what would happen. Because if it really crashed to zero, well, well, I'd be out some money, but at least I hadn't lost my shirt on it. As opposed to, it was also around this time that BitConnect really bit the dust in that it went down to nothing. 
quite literally it closed up shop suddenly, left a whole lot of people uh, wondering where their money went. And lo and behold, the, it seems like the uh, founders either disappeared or ended up getting arrested or something. And yeah, BitConnect is since then seen as one of the great scams of that first uh, crypto bubble, unfortunately. And I feel very sorry for the people who lost their money on that, including my friend. So that uh, that was then. I sat on that Bitcoin now for uh, oh going on close to about three or four years as I saw the price as I saw the uh, price well slowly start to rise again in that after uh, it reached its low of about three thousand and uh, then from there it actually managed to climb back up to about five thousand and then maybe about six or seven thousand and it was at that point I estimated that well from there my investment must had apparently broken even and then. It really stayed around that level of then or between then and 10,000 for probably another couple of years or so. Cut, cut forward now to uh, within the last uh, two years. When suddenly, lo and behold, here came the next wave of uh, Bitcoin and crypto. Suddenly, the price started going up again. And then we started seeing the price once again matching what it was before, like about uh, 50, you know, 10, 15,000. Then it reached twenty thousand, the same that it uh, the same all time high that it had done, and then it just kept on climbing. And here is the part where people began to uh, jump in again, and uh, lo and behold, yet another uh, Bitcoin gold rush started. However, over those past few years, uh, things had changed in that the uh, market, I guess you could call it, or the whole cryptocurrency thing, really had evolved in that uh, some new uh, ideas and some new schemes had uh, gone into place, as I found out. So it wasn't the same as it was before. And in fact, I'm betting that that may very well be the reason why the price had uh, jumped so high again, because, well, a new wave of speculators had come in and were doing their best to try to uh, you know, get the market up. And this was when uh, just within the last, what was it, the last couple of years or so, when uh, Bitcoin once again skyrocketed. Uh, far past 20,000 to the point where at its height, it reached a high of something like 65 to 70,000. So that meant my initial investment uh, was about one third of that managed to be worth almost as much as $20,000, which again, I thought, okay, great, but what can I do? Uh, I honestly really had no clue of how to manage this. I mean, I am not much of a trader, I will say that. I have no intention really of, be, of becoming one of those. You remember the day, the stock day trader craze of like a decade or two ago when people were quitting their jobs to become day traders? And of course, most of them lost their shirts in it. Um, yeah, I was too scared to really try to do anything like that. And it was around that time that I thought, you know, I think I might... I think I might actually see if I can't get something really good out of the deal. I think I'll actually take some of this Bitcoin while it's so high and uh, cash some of it out and get something nice. You know, like this, um, like this uh, stove cast iron pot, for instance. So that was when I actually learned another lesson. You see, I did, in fact, take the time to uh, cash out a little bit of that. And I realized, number one, there were fees for everything. Anytime you do a transaction, there's a fee. You transfer money to another wallet, there's a fee. If you try to actually cash out, boy, is there a fee. My, that, boy, that fee is pretty steep, too. So nonetheless, I did manage to cash it out. And here's the other thing that they don't talk about, the mentality, the whole crypto mentality thing. You see, Part of the pro part of the uh, problem with the, the crypto thing is that it's almost like a cult in this way. Um, let me try it this way. <clears throat> if anybody has been involved in, in anything like a, a cult, like say Scientology, for instance, what you find is this: you find it, you devote your life to really get to the getting the services of the uh, of the cult. Meaning, like with Scientology, for instance, Scientology has. This uh, method, their method of mental health, which they call auditing. And then I'm not going to get into details about that, but that's basically how the whole thing works. You pay exorbitant amounts of money 
for this audit for these auditing courses that will supposedly improve your lives. You've seen the ads for Dianetics and all that. Uh, the thing is, is that what you when you're when you're caught up in it, you don't really you don't really use it for anything other than getting more auditing and more Scientology. All the money you sink into it, you just keep getting more and more like an addict. Um, you don't see you don't see any Scientologist scientists, for instance, or Scientologist race car drivers that are like, no, that's because they're sinking all their money back into it. And that's what it was with crypto. I mean, once I had actually cashed out some of this Bitcoin and I actually had some physical money from it, uh, it's like I have this feeling, you know, if I cash this out and I what if the price really skyrockets and this money I've uh, spent here on this nice cast iron pot, well, does that mean I've essentially wasted it when I could have kept it in and let it uh, accumulate in value even more? See, that's the thing is like you, uh, in crypto, if you're cashing out, the idea is you're not just cashing out, you're quitting, you're giving up. What you want to do is keep getting more and more crypto. Crypto basically exists to get you to buy more crypto. And, that, and yeah, this is one of the things that munchens in line goes up. NFTs are there for you to buy more crypto. Uh, DAOs, DAOs are there, DAOS are there to get you to buy more crypto. Online games that uh, actually pay you in crypto, you know, they encourage you to get more crypto. Not actual money, but more crypto. It's kind of like a vicious cycle there. And that's what you see with a lot of these NFTs uh, that are coming out. And that's the reason why I do feel that there is something of a, a real MLM, you know, multi-level marketing or a scam mentality to it. In that it claims to be legitimate because it's legal. But really, the whole point is just to get you to buy more crypto. And the other thing I uh, I should probably mention at this point is like, uh, what about, yeah, what about NFTs? I mean, it's been said already, what are NFTs? Uh, I could not give you a really detailed description of it because as you can see, I'm still a novice at this. I can't really claim to be an expert. But what I've seen and found felt about NFTs is, is this. I mean, I may not be a uh, crypto professional, but what I am is a former comic book collector. Uh, anybody at all who, and I'm hoping that among this crowd here, uh, you may very well remember or know something about collecting comic books. And by the way, it's time to start going into part two of this. So I'm hoping I've got this thing nice and high at this point. Uh, let me throw a little, oops, let me throw in a little bit more oil, and then we will get on to actually browning this up and getting into some the nice parts of, uh, of uh, bubble and squeak and uh, corned beef hash. Here's the part where you really want to try to get the nice crunchy bits, the tasty bits. But as I said, I'm hoping people who know my channel, I'm hoping at least some of them are from my crowd, you know, the geek crowd, the ones who are familiar with comic books and Dungeons and Dragons and uh, all that fun stuff. If you are, then you probably remember the comic book speculator era of the 1990s. And a lot of that is, I feel, what is happening right now with these NFTs and that they're coming out and we've got what we have are a lot of speculators. And I mean a lot of speculators. And they are selling basically their NFTs to one another, to other speculators. They're not really selling it to members of the public, namely you. They're selling them to other speculators and back and forth, especially to drive up the price. And so we're seeing these ridiculous amounts of uh, money being paid for these uh, ridiculous NFTs. Uh, digital pieces of artwork and that really uh, mean nothing. And they do mean nothing because, in fact, it's not even about the artwork. I'll get into that in just a minute as well. But it's more like, uh, just like in the uh, comic book speculator era, when they came out with these comics that had flashy covers, multiple different colors, color, you know, covers in, uh, printed in chrome and the like, or even gold-plated yeah, really, gold-plated comic book covers. It didn't matter really what the uh, story was. What was important was the uh, speculator value. And that's what I feel is happening with this whole NFT thing. Uh, it's not really even about the artwork. 
which is one reason why the artwork is so ugly. There we go. Now, as far as uh, the corned beef hash is concerned, this is the part where we really want to try to sear this and get a uh, get you know the nice crunchy bits going, if at all possible. So, I'm hoping that I'm hoping I can get this to dry out a little bit, and uh, then we'll be able to. Uh, well, this should be uh, that should be about ready. We'll have some corned beef hash. But yeah, so. I guess that's one reason why I'm concerned about this whole NFTs coming to places like uh, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook because they mean nothing. They're really there just to get you to uh, gamble your money and speculate. It's not about art. It's, um, it's about status. It's really about trying to uh, get as good a deal as possible until you're up there with the Bored Ape Yacht Club. And yeah, I know that there was actually some irony with the uh, creation of the uh, so-called Bored Ape uh, NFTs, and I'm not even interested in that because that's not even the point here. Um, in regards to NFTs, I guess I should try it another way. Think of, uh, let, let's see, what, you're real, what an NFT really is, is a space in a database, and that's it. Like, say, an online game, any, any online game you can think of, or even Twitter, basically what they do is they create a database, period, the end. And they are selling you um, a link to one particular part of the database, and that's it. I mean, it's like, hey, here, you can have a spot in our database. And what's more, we can verify, thanks to the blockchain, that this really is your spot and nobody else can uh, buy your spot. Okay, great. What can I do with it? You can sell it to other people. Okay. Why do I want to do that? Because it's a spot in the database. And this is Twitter. And so that makes, and so uh, you'll, you'll be really special. Uh, okay. What do I get out of it? You get, well, if you uh, sell it to somebody else, you, uh, you'll get that much uh, crypto for it. Okay. Where do these uh, weird gorilla pictures come in? Oh, that, yeah, that, that's actually just something like it's flashy so to, to get you to buy it. You see, what you're really buying is the spot in the database. It doesn't even matter what we put in your spot here. You see, here, here is your uh, profile picture. And we're going to put a link to your profile picture here in this spot so that you can sell this link to your profile picture. You're not selling your profile picture. You're just selling the link. Okay. And this helps improve Twitter how? Well, you get to sell it. Okay. And, and how does that help? You get more crypto. Okay. And then what? Then you get more crypto. Then you can invest in and get more crypto. You get the idea? It's, kind of, it's really a round robin or a circular or an MLM, a multi-level marketing thing. And that's what I don't like about it, because really it's just an, ex just an excuse to try to make people into salespersons in the hope that they will somehow make enough money to, I, well, I guess, you know, to become the next big thing. It's status. And I don't expect to ever do that because I'm not, I'm, you know, who am I? I'm never going to become rich and famous by selling M NFTs. And I doubt that most people will either. Yes, but I heard this kid made, uh, this 12-year-old kid made $120,000 in one day selling NFTs. Yeah, but I don't know the details of what happened there. And quite frankly, a lot of it has to be luck. I, I mean, it's just it just doesn't make sense. It's like buying lottery tickets or even trading on the stock market. I mean, yes, some people do get incredibly rich that way. Most people don't. And that's, well, I mean, that's, I guess, why I'm, why I'm not happy about uh, crypto and NFTs. And that's what I just felt like getting off my, off my chest here. So, uh, yeah. By the way, Honey Badger says comic books for people who read them regularly are installments in a period of time in their lives. <laughs> Argentina announced today they want to make Bitcoin a currency to fight their uncontrollable inflation. Huh. My husband's stepbrother got heavily involved in Scientology. Ugh, my condolences. 
He lost a spouse to it who divorced him after she mortgaged their house and business. Yeah. Crypto has always had a bad smell to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just, I just dropped some chili into my beard. Well, I like that much better, Peg Tooth. <laughs> I'll say that much. John Nathan, John Nathan Shopper. I don't like NFTs, but let me play devil's advocate. It's not wrong to invest in physical commodity futures and stuff like that, uh, which is still just playing around Robin with demand. How, how is crypto worse? Well, I'd say one reason why that it's worse is because it's nothing. I mean, it's not even, uh, you know, it's not like gold or, uh, or comic books or anything like that. It's pretty much just an empty, you know, it's an empty piece of data that has value just because, well, a lot of people say it has value and uh, that's pretty much it. And there's really no worth to it at all, other than the other than whatever value uh, is assigned to it, if by however much you manage to to sell it for. And I, for one, just do, you know, I am not. I don't want to be a salesman. I guess maybe that's what it comes down to. Uh, some people can do it better than others, and more power to them. But what? The thing about uh, multi-level marketing, for instance, is like really the the real the money comes not from what you sell, but from getting other people involved in it. That's where the money comes from. So essentially, you are trying to con pretty much everybody close to you, your friends, your family, all trying to get them to invest, all in the hope that it helps, it makes you pay off or pays off for you. And then you can argue into the fact that it's the people who first got into it in the beginning. They're the ones who benefit from it. And everybody uh, under that is really trying to climb to get to the top. And most of them are, are never going to make it. I guess that's one reason why we're what we're seeing all the time is new NFTs. It's like NFTs, they, they can only exist for a short period of time. And then I guess they're worthless. It's like... I mean, how long on the average do one of these NFT things last anyway? Um, I mean, six months down the line, would you be able to set, to sell an NFT? It's always new. It's always get in on the get in on this now while it's just starting. And that really has the smell of an MLM more than I guess really more than anything else. So um, I don't, yeah, it feels like it's really just taking away time and resources. And I know you can say the same thing really about uh, other forms of other forms of trading, but well, then here's where the other, but comes in all of this crypto. I mean, you can't even get, you can't even, uh, pay, you can't even buy food with it. I mean, as I mentioned, you can't even cash out on it be both because of the mentality that you're not supposed to actually cash it out for actual money. You're just supposed to get more crypto. And if you're starving and you've got all of this Bitcoin, it's not you're not going to be able to eat it. All you do is just keep on buying more and more crypto. And that really ends up uh, pretty much being uh, self-defeating, if you ask me. So, so I, again, I guess I can say I don't like that. Um, yeah, but and further, and what's more, um, the other thing I guess is that NFTs are not the only racket on the block either. Here's the other thing that I don't think they mention much in line goes up or otherwise. You know, it's becoming mainstream now, really, to uh, for, to hate NFTs because it's so easy. It, I mean, it's perfect to uh, go on to on the uh, stupid nightly news in places like. Um, Fox News or even or even CNN or the like, you know, you, I mean, uh, the NFTs. Oh, by the way, here we go. Here is a uh, nice th here's a nice bit of bubble and squeak. It's, uh, you know, piping hot and everything. And I'd say uh, this isn't so bad. But you figure this is like it's perfect for them because it comes with this silly, stupid picture that you can flash on the uh, screen. And it's easy to point to and laugh. Ha, ha, ha. Look at how dumb and how stupid this ugly cartoon ape looks. Aren't these NFTs stupid? Ha, ha, ha. Well, it's more than that. I mean, besides the fact that it's actual people losing money in a lot of cases. And uh, from the fact that, well, 
I mean, again, if you, um, really pretty much most of the uh, stories involving NFTs involve scams or ripoffs or, you know, fly-by-night NFTs or the occasional celebrity trying to sell NFTs. Because, yeah, you, you know, yeah, the celebrity, of course, has the advantage of being a celebrity, in which case then the celebrity probably does make money off of NFTs, whereas not many other people do. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can, you know, you can easily point to, uh, this ugly cartoon ape and say, ha ha NFT. So that's funny. That's awful. But there are other, there are other things uh, going on in the crypto world as well that, uh, I, that, are actually probably may even be worse than, uh, NFTs. You know, um, I mean, NFTs, I feel are a speculator bubble for that reason, that event, that's one reason why they why they're all have to be brand new. You have to get in at the bottom if you can or at the beginning if you can hope to make any um, anything at all from it. But as I was looking into NFTs, I did notice that there's actually something else going on uh, in the uh, cryptocurrency world that probably is potentially even more dangerous because it could very well bring this, if not crashing down, but cause a serious crash in this whole market. And that would be stable coins. Um, I did have a link to one of those things, but part of the reason for this is stable coin is, uh, well, okay, especially because Bitcoin and others are uh, so, you know, the, the um, value of these things is fluctuating wildly. One of the reasons why you can't seem to use Bitcoin for anything other than other Bitcoin is because the value is changing so much that really there is um, there I mean even after all even after several years how many places like Amazon will let you buy some goods and services in Bitcoin um, practically none you can't but you can't spend Bitcoin at Walmart you can't spend Bitcoin at um, um, at Amazon, heck, even Tesla. Tesla had a little nice little racket going. You remember what was it? A year, maybe a couple of years ago, Tesla announced loudly that hey, you know, you can use Bitcoin to buy a Tesla. And then, lo and behold, when that happened, it seems that there was a big spike in the price of of uh, Bitcoin. And good old Elon Musk, he sold he who had happened to have built up a lot of Bitcoin, he uh, sold a bunch of it. And made himself an even heftier profit. And then suddenly, next thing you know, Tesla is saying, oh, no, we can't do that anymore. You can't uh, you can't use Bitcoin anymore to buy a Tesla. But hey, there's always, what do you call it, Dogecoin or Dogecoin. At which point, at which point then, um, well, pretty much the same thing happened. Because Elon Musk said that, uh, said buy Do Dogecoin. A whole bunch of people bought it. The uh, market went, you know, the price for it went up. He sold his, made some nice money, made uh, a nice amount of money on it, and then lo and behold, it crashed again. You know, in the stock market, this would be highly illegal, and you'd think that he would be brought up on charges for that. But funny, you can't do that in the crypto world because it's so unregulated, or as they like to say, Wild West. <laughs> and yet, who profited from all this? Well, Elon Musk did. Who else? <laughs> Not many other people, that's for sure. But I guess that's the point is that you really can't do anything with all this crypto except buy other more crypto. Again, you can't buy, you can't spend crypto at Walmart or, or uh, Stop and Shop or Price Chopper or, uh, or, or even Amazon because the price is so volatile. And that's one reason why they came up with stable coins as a way to try to get around that, to try to, as they call it, stabilize the price by, have, by making it easier to trade Bitcoin for stable coin because a stable coin has a set price. One stable coin equals $1, allegedly. But is anybody who knows even a little bit about, mark, about, the, about the way the markets go is that you can't simply declare the value of, uh, of any uh, coin to be $1. If you could, well, you wouldn't have all this hyperinflation in places like Argentina, could you? No, uh, it would, you have to have some actual physical currency to back it up. 
So that means you really, so that means the companies um, who like Tether, for instance, who manage <clears throat> the uh, the stable coins, they've got to have some actual cash reserves to back, to back it up, right? Well, supposedly the value right now of Tether, for instance, one of the, the biggest stable coin company is about $79 billion. That's billion with a B. Somehow this company is worth $79 billion. Even though it's only been around for like, what is it? Maybe three years or so. And for it to be worth that much, it means it's got to have $79 billion in cash reserves, right? No. $79 billion in cash reserves doesn't exist. And some people say, well, you know, real banks are like that too. And they're only supposed to have 10% 10, 10 of their actual worth in, uh, in physical capital. So that would mean 10% of that. That would still have to mean uh, that Tether has 7 to $8 billion in capital. Except that there have been a couple of half-hearted attempts to try to get Tether to demonstrate they actually have all this money backing up their billions. And they have just hemmed and hawed and changed the subject. And basically given all the signs that they don't have any fiscal money backing it up. You know what that means? It means they've got billions and billions of dollars in this so-called tether coin that they're making up out of thin air. And they're not the only company to do that. If you look, if you do say a Google search, for instance, for the most traded cryptocurrency uh, at close to, if not more than half of all of those different currencies now are stable coins. So I feel there's another bubble right there. It means that there's this bubble that's getting ready to pop. And when the bubble finally bursts, like maybe some company decides they have to call in about $100 million or something in cash reserves and find out that it's not there, that's going to cause a collapse. That's going to cause a run on the bank. And because this industry is so unregulated, it's going to be worse than a banking collapse. So... I'm, will that destroy cryptocurrency? Probably not. Will it cause a lot of people to lose money? Hell yes. So I feel that there is definitely not one but two bubbles going on there in the uh, crypto market. And probably more, in fact, because as I said already, I haven't even looked very hard. And yet these ones were very easy to see, even for me. <clears throat> so... Why would I want to try becoming a wild and crazy crypto investor when it's a bubble that's going to burst and, and a lot of people are going to be hurt when it happens? It's probably going to happen pretty soon, especially because it is just starting to go mainstream. I mean, we're seeing all of these news stories here about how awful NFTs are, for instance. And, and uh, stable coins are even bigger than NFTs. And they seem to still be under the radar. So, yeah, there's going to be a crash. I, I have little doubt about that. So I'm not getting into it. And, yeah, I am kind of discouraging people from, from getting into it for that reason. Okay, I've been talking and talking again. Let me uh, see what else here. All right. Um, but anyway, thank you, everybody, for letting me rant about this. It's just something that I felt like I wanted to do. Um, so yeah, you might have salt, uh, screen is on top chat, not live chat. Oh, good. Okay. My other son is a, is a general contractor has been approached by his clients to accept his payment in Bitcoin. He'd rather take cubic feet of dirt. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing is like, there's no guarantee of what that Bitcoin is going to be worth. And more importantly, how can you cash it out? The fees for cashing out Bitcoin are far excessive than what it you any fees that you would pay to a physical bank these days. So you would lose a lot of money actually trying to cash it out. So it's not easy. It's kind of like actually say, well, we'll pay you in gold. Okay, how can you uh, cash out that gold? You can't eat it. So it's not, not really easy. Hello, Louis J. Cast Iron Cooking and Granny Graham. During last night, I had chat on top of chat instead of live chat. Yeah, that's why... Um, yeah, I guess that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Hello as well for Andrew Bonificio and, um, 
What are you cooking? Looks like bilge to me, Miss French Twist. Probably close to that. It's not exactly bilge. This is, in fact, corned beef hash or bubble and squeak. And this, I'd say, actually has cooked up pretty nicely at this point. So, yeah, as anybody who has actually cooked corned beef hash will tell you, this is really what it looks like. <laughs> but, of course, the whole point is to freshen it up. So, and I agree, it doesn't look very appetizing, does it? <laughs> but nonetheless, there we are. That's, uh, yeah, we actually have ourselves some corned beef hash here. And the, and the nice thing about this is that, again, this is what you can do. This is what you can do. Uh, what you can do from here is actually put a fried egg on top. That's the traditional way to have corned beef hash. Um, and this is what you can do with your leftovers from uh, corned beef and cabbage from, from uh, St. Patrick's Day. Because that's the reason why we do this is, you know, of course, you end up with a lot of the uh, leftover vegetables in uh, corned beef uh, and cabbage. And you put it in this plastic Tupperware bowl. It's always a plastic Tupperware bowl. And you stick it in the back of the fridge and it stays there in the back of the fridge for weeks until you finally throw it out. So instead of doing that, here you go. You fry it up and you make yourself some corned beef hash. So on the whole, this doesn't seem, I don't think this turned out too badly. So, but I really just felt like getting this off my chest because as I said, it's a subject that's, again, it was brought up by a member of the cast iron community. And I would not be surprised if a number of you folks right here have uh, heard about it or maybe been approached in some way or another. Like I said, it's going to be showing up. It's already on Twitter. It's coming to Instagram. If you do any online gaming, I'm sure your local online game, uh, especially the bigger ones, probably already has a set of NFTs that they're selling, you know, based on pictures from the uh, game, from the game itself. And I wouldn't be surprised if people are actually buying, uh, buying them. Which is which is really not which really doesn't mean anything. It means that they're simply buying a link to a picture. So, and whether or not that's worth anything, well, I guess really depends on how much you enjoy the game. So, but still, um, okay. If you put a fried egg on the top of the hash, do you make a sandwich out of it or serve it as a side dish? Yes, you can do both. Uh, you can indeed make a sandwich of it. Really, the whole point of this is to make it what to make it the way you want it. I mean, you could mix in hot sauce or uh, barbecue sauce or whatever you want in this to uh, make it taste good. Or put in some more fresh vegetables like spinach or uh, or even bok choy if you want. So whatever you like, mix it all up in you, the way that you want so that it will taste good to you. That's really the whole point of this. It's meant. Just that. It's it's a leftover hash, and it's a way for you to use up these leftovers. Especially, again, considering if you have kids. You, you know, come up with inventive ways to, uh, get them to, uh, to get them to actually eat it. Because it actually tastes pretty darn good. I mean, it's corned beef and cabbage. It, and what's more, it's been reheated, so now we've got ourselves some good corned beef hash. So, yeah. all right. I can't afford real Tupperware, but I do make use of my old margarine containers. Well, there you go. <laughs> Broccoli, you could do that. How is Nancy Pelosi doing with crypto? Somehow she's done better trading stock part-time than Warren Buffett. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Ugh. You know who else is doing NFTs? Melania Trump. So, yeah, it's like that kind of crowd. The fact that they're all trying to push NFTs is another reason why I want to stay away from it. But that's pretty much, as I said, uh, I wanted to get this off my chest. And I guess I want to encourage anyone, if you hear about this and you're curious, yeah, the easiest thing to say is do your research. And there are places now that do a fairly good job, I guess, of explaining what it is and whether or not you may be interested in it. That's why I, I included a link again at the description of this to that documentary, which is over two hours long, but it, pre but it does a pretty good job of really attacking the NFT, uh, 
NFTs and crypto in general. And that again is the documentary line goes up. <laughs> Funny thing is, is that there have been some interesting reactions to that uh, video too. I mean, that, uh, that, the line goes up documentary has gone really viral. It's like it's only been out for a couple of months now and it already has over 6 million views. So, and people have made reaction videos to it, usually about usually from uh traders and NFT uh, promoters all screaming how he got it wrong and what about the good parts of crypto and he must have a liberal agenda. Yeah, there's a, a reaction video that actually says that. So, most of them only know him as the line goes up guy. His name is Dan Olson, and he's got a really good channel, and I have actually been following it for about three or four years now, and his channel is called Folding Ideas. He started out as really, uh, his channel started out doing film criticism, not just uh, criticizing movies, but criticizing the movie making, and he did some great videos of that. You may remember, this is the same guy who a couple of years ago created this video about how awful the movie Suicide Squad was. Not the remake, not the Suicide Squad. I mean Suicide Squad. And he did an excellent job breaking it down as to why that movie was just so dang awful. That was really what got my attention. And I've been following uh, Folding Ideas ever since. Yeah, he did this another video on uh, that prop, the famous uh, propaganda film, Triumph of the Will. And thanks to that, I had a I had a fun time in his comments section arguing with real white supremacists. Oh, that was fun. And from there, he's also done, well, as a matter of fact, about a year ago, he actually did a take on <laughs> internet cooking videos. And yeah, I was kind of stung by that too. <laughs> Not enough to say, oh, he's terrible and I'm never watching him again. But uh, yeah, but it was actually interesting. So, yeah, Folding Ideas is a really good channel, and not just because of this. This, so far, may be the toughest thing he's ever done. All right. Um, at this point, I'm not sure, uh, really, uh, how else I can continue here. I mean, I don't want to keep going for like an hour and a half like I did last night, especially since we've accomplished what we wanted to accomplish, or I think I did, in that we've got some corned beef hash here. We made some nice corned beef hash in a large cast iron wok. And that's something I encourage you to do with those leftovers that you'll certainly have from your corned beef and cabbage today. You know, again, after you've stuck them in that um, <laughs> um, that margarine container <laughs> in the back of the fridge <laughs> instead of the Tupperware one, uh, and, and, it's, and it's all soggy and soft and everything like that, break out your cast iron and fry and then refry and make yourself some corned beef hash so that you can actually use it up because times are tough. I mean, we need to use, you know, as much as we can because, hey, you've got it. You can get another meal or two out of it. Hi. Right. Anyway, that was really what I wanted to say tonight. Um, I'm not, as I said, if nothing else, I guess I, again, I want to say one last time, encourage folks, go out and do a little research. And by research, I mean real research, you know, try to find some references, try to find some reasonably verifiable or sources of information that are much better than just someone sitting on, at a uh, microphone, uh, shouting into a microphone on YouTube uh, there are sources out there that at least will give a little bit more information. So when on Instagram, when you see them rolling out their NFTs, be skeptical. If you look at uh, Twitter and you see their NFTs, be skeptical. And likewise, if you do online games and your uh, online game is actually uh, is actually pushing its own NFTs, well, be skeptical. I don't mean run away screaming from it. I don't mean attack it. I mean, you know, try just that. Try to approach it with a skeptical eye, and hopefully that may save, help to uh, save someone from losing money. I, I guess that's really the best, best thing I can say here. What I'm really concerned about is, well, again, my friend who got me started in this crypto thing, he lost money on it. His brother lost a lot of money on it, and... Why should we let that happen? So you know, just be careful out there, folks. I mean, just you know, just be just be cautious, be skeptical. Try to keep an open mind, not a, not so open that your that it, your brains fall out. And just well, above all else, as always, though, have fun and uh, well, take care of the persons you love. So.
I don't think I could say anything else. And that, at least, is corned beef, uh, corn beef hash on St. Patrick's Day, <laughs> done in cast iron. Well, I hope this hasn't been too boring. That's all I can say. The corned beef would look great on poutine with gravy on the side. I would agree there. Yeah, that I would very much be interested in doing that. Yes, very good suggestion. And having said all that, like I said, we're at an hour now. That's longer than I expected. I'm not going to go for an hour and a half. I think we're about done now. I very much appreciate everybody showing up here. I mean, this is the second live I've done this week. And as, as I said, it's a, a different topic than what I've usually covered. As you can see, I'm an amateur at it. I don't claim to be an expert, which is another reason why don't take my word as gospel. Get some additional advice on this. But please get some advice and don't just throw money at it because you, you'll think you'll you think you'll uh, make you think you'll be able to get rich off of it. You know what they say? If it looks too good to be true, it probably is. And enjoy your corned beef and cabbage today, folks. And happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody. And yeah, I will be back next Wednesday. And I hope to have another video out this weekend as well. So not a live one, but an edited one. And as always, as I said, see you next Wednesday, folks. Thank you very much for dropping by. Have a good evening.